Hello tankers and pilots, my name is Solfax and welcome to the pilot episode of War Thunder Weekly, a show in which we go through what has happened last week in War Thunder and discuss those same things. Now since this is a pilot episode and I'm just working on the format, I'm open to all suggestions and criticisms, so if you'd be so kind to post them in the comment section below of this video or in the respectable threads and forum posts that I'll be posting about this video on various sites. So let's get down to the first episode. Just for this one episode, I'll be covering a bit more than one week's worth of news to provide some context for these videos and to get my foot in the door, so to speak. But I will not be using this opportunity to comment on the recent ground forces pool. It happened, it was a badly thought out idea, but nothing came of it. End of story. Now that I've gotten that out of the way, I can tell you that the great devblog spam of May 2016 has started and already kind of ended. We got confirmation of a bunch of new vehicles prior to the opening of the dev server for only 12 hours and the release of the preliminary patch notes for the update 1.59 called Flaming Arrow. But what's most important, Gaijin announced that in 1.9 we will be receiving a whole new type of vehicle in War Thunder. Some players might have already seen this coming, seeing how we already do have a bunch of rocket equipped tanks and armored vehicles in the game, but in 1.9 Gaijin will be bringing us a whole new rocket mechanics in ground forces, or more importantly and more precisely, new missile mechanics in ground forces. That's right, in 1.59 Gaijin will be introducing armored vehicles equipped with assisted targeting guided missiles, or ATGMs for short. This has been first hinted by a post on Live.WarThunder, where user Grandfather posted photos of a Russian-only event called, of course in free translation, the next big War Thunder update that displayed a modified version of a T-54 called the IT Dracoon, with the cannon replaced by ATGM rockets. Short time after that, a user called TipMixKing posted a link to this video in the comments of the same post that shows the IT-1 in action at the Gaijin event in Moscow. In this video, which was uploaded by Mr. Polygon Shootok on YouTube, you can see the AT-1 driving around, shooting at various tanks, and you can see that the, say, the missile that was deployed by the AT-1 Dracoon is controlled by the mouse cursor and has a very slow velocity. Another thing you can see in this video, which is even more amazing than controlling a missile with the mouse, is actually shooting down a B-29 mid-flight with this missile. The final confirmation that ATGMs will be arriving in War Thunder and 1.59 was given to us by developer BVV underscore D in a Russian Q&A session. The translation was provided by a Reddit user called Lordy Kioner, I hope that's how it's pronounced, and in this Q&A the dev confirmed that every current ground forces nation will be getting their own non-premium standard 3 ATGM equipped vehicle in the next patch, with unfortunately one exception being Britain, as was later confirmed by the senior community manager Boris. I hope that's how it's pronounced. The premium STRV.81, a Swedish modified Centurion Mark III with three ATGMs attached to the third, will be the only ATGM available to British players in the upcoming patch. That will be ratified in an upcoming patch after this one. While I was making this video, the dev server was open for a very short time. I didn't have the chance to actually get on it because it was open during the night for most of us European players. But with that dev server, Gaijin released the preliminary patch notes for patch 1.59 and it outlined most of the changes and more importantly most of the vehicles that will be coming in the next patch. So for starters, I want to go over the ATGMs because naturally they are the most interesting addition. The first ATGM announced was the IT Dracon, which I mentioned earlier. It was designed by the Soviets during the Cold War in 1964, but due to various reasons saw only limited production and limited service from 1968 to 1970. According to the wiki, it was based off Hall of a T-62, but in the game it probably will be based off Hall of a T-54, I'm not really sure about that one. But anyhow, the hull remained largely the same, but the turret had a complete overhaul in order to mount the amazing 3M7 Dracon missile. Some of the reasons the Dracon was never largely accepted was the large dead zone around the tank created by the missile's minimum range of 300 meters. It could carry only limited ammunition, only 12 rockets, and the additional equipment required to mount the missiles in the turret was very cumbersome and 520 kilos heavy, and very hard to use. Since we're talking about War Thunder here, a bit more about the missiles. The 3M7 Dracon missile weighs 54 kilos, but the warhead is only one tenth of its weight at 5.8 kilos. It travels to its targets at the speed of 217 meters per second, that's the wiki, but in game it travels at 220 meters per second, has a max range of 3300 meters, and on impact it can penetrate 250 millimeters of rolled homogeneous armor sloped at 60 degrees from the vertical, 
and which means that when shooting at flat armor, it could penetrate 500 mm of flat armor. In in-game terms, this thing can most likely penetrate most vehicles it will face head-on, even the infamous mouse, but the slow velocity of the missiles and the way that you're supposed to aim them will make shooting anything but the mouse difficult at range. Moving on, the second 8 EGM announced was Raketenjagdpanzer II, a vehicle developed by West Germany at the same time as the Kanonenjagdpanzer, and every fool could see it bears a striking resemblance to its cannon-armed cousin. Retaining the same awesome mobility and basic armor layout, but substituting the cannon for missiles, the Raketenjagdpanzer was equipped with 14 SS-11 missiles, which don't sound so amazing when you consider they travel at only 190 meters per second and under 500 meters. According to the wiki, the accuracy leaves much to be desired. But I think that will be ratified by the fact that the penetration values of the missiles when they hit rolled homogeneous armor that is not sloped is 600 millimeters, it'll be really enough to make up for all the flaws. But still, if so far these vehicles just don't sound like your jar of jam, fear not because the best is yet to come. Prepare yourselves, cover your head in fear and especially your anuses because with this next tank, dispersing good old American freedom will become hell of a lot more fun. The icon of the Vietnam War and the sole reason most of us will finally bear down and ride for the US Forces 3, the M551 Shuriden, will finally be introduced in War Thunder. This awesome little tank was designed in the early 1960s during the Cold War, with production starting in 1966 and it had its trial by combat in 1969 in the jungles of Vietnam at the height of the conflict itself. What's so great about this little tank is that it follows the usual American light tank doctrine, but with a substantial twist to it. Instead of arming a medium caliber fast firing cannon to the Shuriden, the designers opted for the monstrosity that is the M81 152mm cannon that can also fire MGM 51 Shellac ATGMs. I am 100% sure I mispronounced that. If you thought it's too good to be true, you might be onto something because the Shellac missile can only be used after you unlock a modification for it. But in the meantime, the 152mm heat shell that is the default shell on the Shuriden will do just fine close to medium quarters combat. The Shilag missile has a maximum range of 2200 meters, travels at a velocity quite similar to the S11 of the Raketenjagdpanzer, and can penetrate roughly 600mm of raw homogeneous armor at 0 degrees from the vertical. If hearing all of this doesn't make you want to grind through those pesky Shermans, I really don't know what will. On a much lower note, the last of the ATGMs and the only premium of its kind is the STRV-81, a Swedish modification of the British Centurion Mark III equipped with the Robot.52 ATGMs. Since this is a premium vehicle, I don't want to go too much in depth on this vehicle because, well, honestly, I won't be caught dead paying 50 plus euros for a virtual tank and I know that most of you won't be either. The STRV-81 is basically the same as the Centurion Mark III in the regular British III, but equipped with three Robot 52 ATGMs, which are almost identical in all things to the SS-11 of the Raketenjagdpanzer II. Another thing worth considering is that since these are first generation ATGMs, the SS-11 and the MG-51 being second generation, instead of using the mouse to steer the missile, you must use W, S, A and D keys in realistic battles and simulator battles, and the STRV can only carry three robot missiles, so after you fire them, it becomes your standard Centurion Mark III. Those were all the ATGM equipped vehicles coming in 1.9, and now the introduction of ATGMs in War Thunder is a controversial fact. Some people dislike the idea and think it will further ruin the already lackluster balance at tier 5, and others are completely fine with them being introduced and looking forward to playing them. Me personally, I'm on the fence on this one. On one hand, these missiles all have the potential to auto pen most tier 5 tanks, so there is a chance that Depending on how difficult or in term how easy it is to aim these things and how much damage they do upon a penetration that these ATGMs do prove to be really powerful at tier 5 and just outright stomp tier 4 tanks. But well, on the other hand, we get the Shuriden, so yay! Honestly, I'm really on the fence on this one and I'm going to have to play these tanks and play against them to make up my mind. But that being said, this part of the video where I talk about the ATGMs is over and there's quite a few things still up to discuss, so let's just get right down to it. Another big game changing mechanic coming in 1.59 that I failed to mention so far is the inclusion of the quote med packs unquote for crew members called trauma packs. 
How they work is still not entirely clear to me, but from what I understand, these trauma packs are a consumable item, much like the different kinds of ammo and bombs that you need to purchase before entering a battle. And they can be used to bring back one downed crew member into action at approximately half health, providing that there is a crew member unconscious. Basically, these trauma packs can revive one and only one crew member per tank. They cannot be purchased during a battle. They can only be used when one of your crew members is already down, so there is no healing of existing conscience crew members. Another feature is an auto use of this trauma pack. If a player is hit by a shell that leaves only one crew member remaining, thus killing the tank, the trauma pack will auto activate and revive one additional crew member, sort of acting like an optional last man standing, where you can use it before you get only one crew member left to revive one of your crew members and you can just leave it in case you get hit by a very big shell that knocks out all but one of your crew members and then continue fighting with two crew members. This is another hotly debated subject and I'm again on the fence on this one but I'm leaning towards liking the inclusion of trauma packs more than disliking them because simply I hate the alternative with a burning passion and the alternative I'm talking about is of course less man standing. And even though trauma packs retain much of last man standing functionality, because players have more control over when and how to use this trauma pack, there will be many instances, at tier 4 and below at least, where a player you're shooting at has already used up his trauma pack before engaging you and you won't have to kill a single crew member twice. And of course, there will never be instances when a player is running around with only one crew member in his tank. This video has gone on long enough, so to wrap it up I will go through the most interesting vehicles coming in 1.59, so in no particular order, here goes... Other than the cute little Shiraiden, the Yanks will be getting the monstrous and unfortunately premium T-29, and another icon of the Vietnam War, the M48A1 Patton, which strangely never got its own dev blog, but moving on to the Russians... Russian players will be glad to hear that they will be getting a bunch of high tier aircraft, such as the versatile Yak-30 jet fighter, the Soviet reverse engineer B-29, the Tupolev 4 with some awesome defensive environment, and a pair of new lightly armored tank destroyer, the ASU-57 and the larger ASU-85. Germans will receive a bunch of new vehicles this patch, but the ones I'm most excited for are the Sturer, Sturer Emil, ugh, Sturer Emil, and it's 128mm of anti-tank derp, and the HE-219A7 Nightfighter. Interestingly, the first plane to be added that was modeled and textured by a regular player, much like any of us. Britain, on the other hand, got shafted this patch again and will be receiving only one non-premium vehicle, the mighty Halifax Mark III-A, and the rest being premiums I refuse to mention. Lastly, Japan got a few new additions to its fighter fleet, the N1K1JA and the K161-2, which I unfortunately don't have any screenshots of, and since I don't play Japanese all that much, I have absolutely nothing to say about these aircraft. And that concludes the first episode of War Thunder Weekly. I know I haven't covered all the things that have happened in this time period, but cut me some slack. A major update is hard to cover in one video that's supposed to cover a bit more than just the update, but I ended up covering the update and nothing more. Yeah, anyhow, the next update will be uploaded next Friday, hopefully, so until then, my name has been Solfax, hope you've enjoyed, and I will see you next time.